Well, that was some pretty good worship there, wasn't it? Yeah, so good to be able to reflect on God's faithfulness in our lives. So I love that. Well, good morning, Heights. Good morning. Trust you're enjoying your uh, July 4th weekend here. I'm looking forward to hanging out with you out uh, after the service in our food trucks. Last night I was able to try the ice cream sandwich. It's a custom sandwich, homemade, amazing. You can put it together. They say you can share it. I don't believe it. <laughs> no, don't, don't follow that advice. It's amazing. So, but today I'm going to look forward to eating the Mexican. So it, everyone was raving about it last night. So, so make sure you check that out. Well, I suppose you've seen the TV commercials uh, over the years and even recently uh, when there's typically the rugged, bearded, strong, he-man type of guy that rep represents American rugged individualism. And women have been a part of this uh, recently as well. I, I saw a Chevy truck commercial that actually talked about this specifically uh, while the song, you know, Like a Rock, you know, is in the background there, and I can't sing that for you, but... Um, <laughs> People generally admire American rugged individualism. I mean, there's all these men and women, they're rough and tough, they're working hard, they're dirty and grungy, they're wearing cowboy hats, they're lifting heavy stuff, and of course they're Chevy trucks. Men and women who need nothing, got it together. I remember those, that billboard back in the 80s, we still see it from time to time, the, the Marlboro Man, remember that one? Yeah. Yeah, one man all alone out in the horse in the middle of nowhere. I mean, he was the epitome of American rugged individualism. We, pe we honor people who take a dinghy across the Atlantic. We, but those who make these amazing solo flights, I mean, we think, wow, it's amazing, the people who climb Mount Everest. And we have this mentality that this rugged individualism is the stuff that separates the women from the, the girls and the men from the boys. It appeals to us. And there's something about the fact of doing something all alone, all by yourself, nobody else. Says, you know, I've, I've conquered it all, I've conquered everything, and, you know, everybody else, I, you know, I don't need. I'm independent, I'm self-sufficient. There's an appeal there, isn't there? Is it possible that this attitude that pervades our society and our culture that we've experienced, is there any chance that any of that has made its way into the church? I mean, is it possible we translate our theology, well, hey, you know, I have the Holy Spirit, I have Christ, I'm sufficient, I'm not sure if I really need anybody else. And because we don't live communally, communally like they did in the Old Testament, you know, they lived in tribes, or the New Testament, they lived in their father's homes, you know, we're independent, we're prosperous, we can, we can have our own homes. Have we as Christians fostered this same American rugged individualistic mindset and attitude? Do we as the church today struggle to get back to this concept of what the church was meant to be? Well, we're going to take a look to see what the Apostle Paul has to say about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But before we do, uh, let's just take a moment and, and pray and commit this time to the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that you teach us today about what it means for us to be the church here at Woodman Heights. Lord, may you lead and guide each one of us here I pray that you would help us to just understand perhaps even the role we might play, each of us. Lord, we just, we just ask for your wisdom. We ask for discernment. Lord, that we might even be able to know, are we, are we being impacted by our culture in some way? So, Lord, we just need your spirit. Open up our hearts, work in our hearts. Lord, we need you to work. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, let's start by reading 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 is where we're going to start. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. So here we see the Apostle Paul, he's using an analogy of the body and describing the church. And an analogy is just another way of saying something or describing something, and he wants to communicate a spiritual truth here through this analogy. And actually, this is, this is the best metaphor that's ever been used to define the church. You don't see it in the Old Testament, but it's very unique metaphor in defining the church. Look at verse 12. It says, for as the body is one, and then at the end of the verse, so also is Christ. Like a human body is Christ's church. We're an organism. We're not a structured system. We're a living system. We're not just organized. We're alive. The church is a plurality of living cells, all alive, all beating, 
It says all having eternal life, all vital, all necessary. And this is the message that Paul has for the Corinthians. And the reason he has this message, just like other cases where he has certain words for the Corinthian church, is because they're not functioning in this way. In fact, the church in Corinth is a mess. When you read the book of 1 Corinthians and you read up to this chapter 12 and read through the book, there's all kinds of descriptions and words uh, and things that Paul addresses and, and mentions that really gives us some background and context for his audience, for, for this Corinthian church. He says there's all kinds of division. There's griping and complaining. There's quarrels. There's arguments. There's bitterness. There's envy, pride, selfishness. I mean, I could, I could go on and on. I mean, you get the picture, right? I think that perhaps one of the challenges today of the, the big C church, you ever hear us talk about the big C church? It's really pretty much anyone who says they're following Jesus in some way. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to church, but it's all over the world, the big C church. And, and a lot of times it's even referred just to the overall church in America. The big C church, especially in America, has become very organized. I think from any clear study in church history, there's just so much more sophistication than there's ever been. I mean, just look at our own you know, American culture and society, right? I mean, incredible systems and processes. We are leveraging technology. It's really amazing. I mean, the technology is, is, no, is better than we've ever experienced in the world, right? And as a church, I think it's really helped us to become a lot more effective. We've been able to reach a lot of people because of all that. But I think there's also a challenge in there that it potentially creates for us, especially those of us who are regular just church attenders in terms of how we experience the church, even perhaps how we, ex we perceive the church. Further, the church was never designed to be run by paid professionals who do the work while many of the people watch. You know, we live in a culture, we, our society, you know, we're like, we're like watchers, aren't we, in our culture? I mean, we watch. We sit at home and we watch the world happen on the screen. And if we leave home, we go and we go watch something. We go watch, you know, our kids play sports. We go watch someone play some music or, or, or whatever. We, we watch. And when we do, there's typically there's, there's no real involvement. You know, there's no real commitment, no real responsibility. We watch. And I wonder if perhaps the big C church, as we think about the broader church, potentially has been influenced by our society, by a culture that we've been turned into more of a spectator place, like the local religious production that you just go and you watch. So what is the church? When the Apostle Paul says that it's a body in this metaphor, what's he mean? Well, it's an organism. It's not an organization. The church is something that is living. Now, a corpse is organized. It isn't alive, but you can look at a corpse and say, wow, amazing. I mean, all the limbs are in the right place, the bone structure, it's flawless, the organs are in the right spot, they're all connected to the right things, all there, but not living. It's an organization. It ceased to be an organism. And so when God wants to show us the church, he shows it to us in these organic terms, in terms that will say to us, everyone is a living part of this body. We're not a spectator. It's not just this structured organization run by professionals. It's a living, breathing, vital organism. So he develops this analogy of the body along three lines. He says that the human body illustrates unity, the human body illustrates diversity, and the human body illustrates harmony. So let's take a look at what the Apostle Paul has to say here in verse 12. And he says that in this illustration of the human body, that that's what the church ought to be as well. So, verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Here we see this value of unity by pointing out the fact that the body is one. He says, we receive the same spirit. We've been placed in the same body. It's just beautiful unity here. I mean, there aren't any members of the body that are higher or lower than the others. Uh, there aren't any greats and non-greats. In fact, it says there's neither Jew or Greek nor bond or 
free. So basically, we're one. There aren't any upper and lower class Christians, no highbrow, lowbrow Christians. There's no strata that's involved here. There's just beautiful unity. And we all have the life of God that's flowing through us. In fact, uh, later, and, and Paul talks about this Ionios Zoe. That's the eternal life that we share together. We share this together and we are one. In fact, he brings this out in Ephesians 4. We put it on the screen here. It says, there's one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, above all, through all, and in you all. I mean, we're one body. We're one. Now listen, there's no spiritual loners in the body of Christ. I mean, even if you might feel it as an introvert, like, you know, give me my space. There's no outside people. There's no hangers-on. There's no drifters or spectators. We're all one. And if you have the life of God pulsing through you as I do through me, you're as vital to this organism as any limb is vital to the human body. There aren't any degrees of importance. There aren't any degrees of responsibility in terms of who's more significant or less significant. We're all equal. We're all spiritual necessities of this body. We're equal. It's an organism. And it depends its total life on every single little part, no matter how minute you might think it is. So you get the picture of the church? We're not an organization. We're not a business. We're not a group of people who just come and watch what happens and paid professionals, they just do their thing. We're a living cell. We're a community of people who live and breathe the same air. We're citizens of the same kingdom, members of the same family, a bride of the same bridegroom, a sheep of the same flock, branches of the same vine. And best of all, we're members of the same body. And you're just as important as me, and I'm just as important as you, and there's never any other way to look at it. And so if you're not playing a part, if you're not actively and practically involved in terms of what is happening in the body of Christ, which the local church is the expression of that, the body is crippled. Do you realize that? You say, you mean you can't, I mean, I'm really that important? Really? I think that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to tell us here in this text. And maybe you just don't understand how important you really are because you just haven't really tried out your importance here. You haven't really been able to see what could be done through you. Well, let's continue here, verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. For the body does not, uh, or if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would make it any less of a part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, and yet one body. The body must have diversity. I mean, if all of us were the same, I mean, just how monotone, how monotonous, I mean, just how boring we would be, right? And if all of us had the same gifts, I mean, I don't think we'd be able to reach the world the way we can. In the way we do. I don't think we'd be able to show the love and the care that we'd be able to fulfill the calling that God has to, in our unique way to reach only the people that we can reach. I appreciate the way our, our worship team here, how they lead us in worship, and, and they're wonderful. And it's also really fantastic for me to just hear you sing out here. I mean, I can really relate to that. And you just even this morning, just to hear you singing when we went quiet there, it was it was awesome and to hear some of you just really sing out. Like, I can, I can relate to you on some of that. In fact, at home, a lot of times I'm just kind of really going after it. And, um, and my wife actually is a voice major from Bible school days. And, um, you know, sometimes I get this thing like, you know, maybe, maybe I should join the worship team. <laughs> yeah. But then I wake up. <laughs> and I can hear the words of my wife saying, um, yeah, Andrew, maybe you just need to keep preaching, you know? <laughs> I mean, we all have our gifts, don't we? We all have our talents. And it's because that's God's design. His, his design is not uniformity. 
I mean, we're different from each other. We have different skills, different passions, different hopes and dreams. And we need each other because God has given every single one of us a unique spiritual gift that's empowered by the Holy Spirit for the purpose to be used in the body of Christ. And it's essential to the body. I mean, do you know what your spiritual gift is? Are you, are you using that? The Apostle Paul, he's writing this letter to this crazy mixed up church here in Corinth. And he says, people, you're the body of Christ. I mean, you're the hands and feet of Jesus. But here's the part you have to lean into. And each one of you is a part of it. Every single one of you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a part of this thing. And you might say, well, I don't feel like I'm a part of it. And I'm not sure if I really want to be a part of it. In fact, I used to be a part of it. And I'm not sure if I want to be a part of it anymore. And Paul would say, well, that's not how it works. And you might be saying, well, what do you mean? That's not how it works. And Paul would say, no, no, this is it. And this is what he would say to us because this is what he said to the Corinthian church. He says, if your foot would say, let me just pause right there. In reality, if your foot would say something, like game over, right? <laughs> yeah. So that would be a little crazy. But for sake of Paul's analogy here, if your foot would say, I'm not a hand, so I don't belong to the body. Could the foot just stop being part of the body? No. If any of your body parts decide that they're not going to be part of the body anymore, the rest of the body is just going to say, oh, yes, you are. I mean, sorry. You're part of this body whether you want to be or not. It's too bad. And if the ear should say, and the readers by now, they're, they're probably laughing as they're hearing this. And if the ear should say, I want to be an eye, and if I can't do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, I mean, I don't want to play anymore. I mean, it's, it's not like this game where you just take mar marbles and go home. And Paul says, I'm sorry, you're attached to this body, whether you want to be or not. Now, if I really wanted to traumatize you to make this point, I could have put a picture of a disconnected body part up here on the screen. <laughs> yeah, we know that's not pretty, right? In fact, it's pretty gross. And I think that's the message of Paul here. It's like, don't be gross. <laughs> kind of sounds like your kids, doesn't it? Yeah. Don't be gross. I mean, don't be a disconnected body, body part. Well, finally, the body works together in harmony. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not, and this is at, uh, verse 15, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So we're back to this analogy of the foot here. And these two things, the first two things, the unity and diversity, they have to happen. They're essential and for us to get to this part of, of harmony. So here's this analogy of the foot again. And the foot is not anything particularly beautiful or lovely, right? Especially if you happen to live in that day and age. In fact, you wore sandals and your foot were covered in mud and dirt. And it really in that time, it was like the foot is like the worst body part ever is really how it was thought of. And so one might say, you know, I'm just this lug, ugly thing, this foot, usually covered by dirt, not seen. And, you know, even if you did uncover it, I mean, I don't think it's worth seeing. And because I'm not a hand, because I'm not more visible and out there, you know, so I'm not part of the body. I mean, can we really remove ourselves from the body of Christ? Can we depreciate our own importance, even if we don't think we're important, even if we don't think we have anything to offer at all? Does it really eliminate our responsibility as a part of this body? Because if God made you to be a foot, that's God's design for you. And we have to accept that. And we have to engage in it. And we have to take that and use that in the body of Christ. But you know, the interesting thing is that this whole discussion is actually based on the next chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Does anybody know what we call that chapter? The love chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Weddings. I mean, it's like that's how we know that. It's all about love. It's like, oh, this romantic love. You know, how we're going to have this unconditional love with each other. Do you realize that's all about the body of Christ? In terms of how we're to behave. That the, the primary thing in this whole discussion of spiritual gifts and how we relate and interact with each other it's about that servant spirit to give and to unconditionally love. That's what this is all about. And it's whenever we say, you know what? It doesn't matter if I'm a hand or a foot. 
but it's about me engaging in this body. Because when I do that, that's when the harmony comes, when I'm engaged and when I'm loving and serving and caring for the needs of this body. Whatever the needs are, it doesn't matter. The body's hurting, I need to be there and play a role. Whatever, it is, whatever my gift is, it really doesn't matter. So we have this unity, we have this diversity, but it's harmony. And we're like, what's the need? I'm there to meet that need. Well, friends, if you're a follower of Christ, we are stewards of this movement called the church. The responsibility for there to be a church that's going to be available to the next generation is in our hands. And we have a choice to make. We will either take from it, consume it, leave it weaker, sidelined, ineffectual, because we got what we wanted out. We can say, you know, I'm going to go to heaven when I go, I die. And I like this preacher over here, and I like this preacher over here, and I'm going to take a little bit of that, a little bit of this, and I'm just going to do my own thing. You know, I, I just don't have time to be engaged. You know, I'm just going to consume. I'm just going to just be here and consume. And, you know, for, for those of us who are parents or even grandparents, I mean, what, what kind of thing are we, we modeling to that next generation, to our kids, to our grandkids? And you can be a consumer. Yeah, I mean, it's totally easy than ever to do that. I mean, I totally understand it because we've really made it easier than ever. Because, I mean, we're trying to te take technology and leverage it and use it to, to reach more and more people for the gospel all over the world. And, and, and it's working in a lot of ways. But I think it's having an effect, this effect of consumerism here in the American church. And we have a choice to make. You can either consume and disengage, or we can engage with the local church and be sure that the local church continues to be a, a conscience of our nation, continues to be an influence and a conscience in our world. I mean, why do you think that most of the world has risen in outrage in terms of what has happened with Russia, with Ukraine? I mean, why is it that people all over the world who aren't even Christian, and they think this is wrong, do you realize it's the impact of the church? There's a sense of ought not not that comes right from the teachings of Jesus 2,000 years ago. I mean, just read your history. I mean, once upon a time, what's happening in Ukraine, I mean, that's just the way it was. Look at your history. And not anymore. But why? It's because of the church. It's because of the teachings of Jesus. And a lot of people say, no, it's just intuitive. I mean, you just kind of know it's wrong. <laughs> it's not true. Not everybody knows where that comes from and, and, and why it's wrong. And this conviction came from the teaching and life of, teaching, uh, of, of, the, of the local church, of Jesus through, through the local church. You know, all the supposed experts... They're saying the church in America is dying and the pandemic just sped up the decline. So I have a question for you. And I don't want you to answer this out loud. I just, I just want you to think about this. Do you know who determines whether or not this is true? Do you know who determines if the church is going to be here as a strong, vibrant, loving community of faith for our children, for our grandchildren, for our great-grandchildren? Do you know who determines whether we become Europe? And if you're from Europe, I mean, this isn't offensive to you at all because you know what has been going on over the years in the church in Europe. Because, you know, I've been there. I have some friends who are leaders there. We, we partner. We have church partners there. And you know what these partners would say? They'd say, you know, you can't just become consumers of content. They say, don't let that happen on your watch. Don't let what happened in Europe happen to the United States. Fight for it. Support it. Be a part of it. Because these church leaders, I mean, they're fighting so hard to revitalize that church. It's crazy. So the question is, will we be the church as it was intended to be? Will we fulfill our divine mandate? Will we be good stewards of this extraordinary thing that Jesus launched that he laid down his life for. And he said, even after I'm God, you know what? The church will go on, and you can choose to participate or not. In every generation, there's always been a group of people who've risen up, and they've said, you know what? We're going to keep this thing fresh. We're going we're to keep the main thing the main thing and keep this thing going. And so the question to us is, can we fulfill 
this divine mandate? And I believe the answer is absolutely yes. But it's going to take all of us who are followers of Jesus to engage. Now, this is just, this is important stuff. And I, and I really, I've hesitated to, to say some of this, but as a leader of this church and specifically as the, the pastor of this campus, and this is just you and me this weekend, with this role as campus pastor, it really comes a responsibility where I have to keep you informed. I have to encourage you. I have to come alongside you. I have to let you know what's going on here in our local congregation. And I think this is an exciting opportunity, if you're a follower of Jesus, to be a part of the body of Christ. And I really believe, especially from our text today, that this is God's will for your life, to be a part of the body of Christ. I don't think there's any question about it. I mean, I don't know what God's will is in terms of where you work or how you work out or what you eat or any of that stuff. But when it comes to being engaged in the body of Christ, which is the local church, I think it's pretty clear. And let me just say, too, if you're new here and you're still checking this place out, you know, lots of grace, time, no pressure. But as soon as you say, okay, this is my church, I really hope you're going to engage. Because you're going to experience life change like you never had before, and you're going to be a part of seeing others experience that life change as well. I'm hoping I just, I don't come across as critical and judgmental here. And, and for some of this, it, this is just a time to re-engage. And to be honest, I've really struggled with how to approach you with this. And I understand life happens. And for some, I think we've just fallen out of that habit to serve. And remembering, we've just forgotten about the mission that we're all a part of. And I know you're grateful for what God has done in your life. I know it's in your heart. But maybe you just haven't taken that step yet. I mean, we've made this online worship experience, like, so convenient. I mean, it's so easy. And maybe it's too good. And while we as a church really do need you, this is not about the fact that we need you. No, you need us. Because you're already a member of the body of Christ. And what's at stake is just way too big. It's way too big for us to be content just to be consumers. And I'm not begging you. I'm inviting you. Not to just attend something. I'm inviting you to participate to engage. It's an invitation of a lifetime. And this is why. Because short of what you do for your family, of the investment that you make in your family, there is no greater investment of your time and your life than in the local church because it's the epicenter of God's activity in this world. It's the epicenter of God's activity in this community. And to the degree that we participate together, amazing things happen. Whenever the body of Christ is active in a community, that community thrives. People are better. Kids are safer. Marriages are healthier. And on and on it goes. I mean, we know this. The church is the hope of the world. And Jesus, he, he looked at his guys and he said, you know, you are the light of the world. <laughs> They're thinking, seriously? Like, the light of the world? Like, I've never even been 10 miles from my house. How am I going to be the light of the world? And he said, if you follow me, you're going to be the light of the world because you will flourish. And your community will flourish. And it will ultimately influence the world. And guess what? It did. We have a very simple mission here at Woodman. It's to love well, changing lives through Christ. Our experience is that following Jesus will make your life better and make you better at life. It'll make your life better. It'll make you better at life. And when we have enough people who follow Jesus and they come together in a local church, the community does get better. So how do we love well here as a church, as a local congregation? Well, it's by engaging all of us into the mission of what the local church is. I mean, we want children, students to be engaged in the life and the mission of the church. We want adults at every level to be engaged in the life of the church, to embrace this mission 
that we have as a church. And let me tell you, just a week ago when we had summer camp here, it was amazing to see our adults and our students and our kids and how many were engaged to minister to our community and these families. I mean, it was a microcosm of the church and the spiritual gifts in action. So I want to give you three ways that you can engage in the mission of Woodman Heights. And there was a card that you received on the way in. And actually, if you want to start filling that out, you can. Just put your contact information on there. If you notice, there's a, a QR code on the back of that that takes you to the website. So there's just a form you can fill out there and do that on your phone. So feel free to jump on there and do that. But the first way that you can engage in the mission here at Woodman Heights is to look for invite opportunities, to ask, ask people to actually come and sit with you here at church. You know, when someone says, hey, yeah, I'm looking for a church, or, you know, I don't, I don't go to church, to say, hey, you know, instead of, instead of a, you know, maybe you should come to my church sometime. No, more specific. Hey, why don't you come sit with me? Why don't you, do, like, are you available this weekend? Why don't you come sit with me? How's this Sunday look? And you just look for those opportunities to ask that, that question, to make that invitation. You know, perhaps, you know, just things aren't going great in their life. Maybe there's a struggle with finances or family or relationships or work. Just say, you know, we have a great community here. Why don't you just come sit with me, join me. I think you'll, you'll be encouraged. It could be people who are in transition. You know, it could be a, it could be a new job. It could be they just moved to the area. A new child. You know, perhaps they're moving into empty nesting or just retiring. Just say, hey, this is a great place here. Why don't you come sit with me? Join me here at church. Now, there's good news and bad news about this. The bad news is that most people won't join you. But the good news is if enough of us keep making that invitation, we're going to have an impact on this community. Because you know what happens is it takes about five, six, seven invitations a lot of times before someone is like, you know, I keep hearing about this church. You know, and you get invited and you're like, yeah, you know, someone else told me about that church. Too, and I've been hearing great things about that. And maybe I should come and check it out. And you just never know. You might be number three out of five. But you never know what hangs in the balance in that invitation, do you? And that, the reason I know this is because some of you sitting here, this is your story. You know I'm not making this up. Because someone invited you. They had the courage. They took the risk. They didn't know how it was going to turn out. And here you are, sitting here with your life changed. Can we partner together? Can you invite the people that you run into, wherever it is, where there just might be that invitation, that opportunity for an invitation? And that's living out our value that's out on the wall in the atrium of gathering. It's not just about us coming and worshiping. It's about inviting others into this. Well, the second way that you can be on mission to be engaged here at Heights is to participate in community. And our community groups are just a great expression of this. It's one way. But it really makes a, a big church feel small. Uh, this is where you just get that connection that breeds that mutual accountability that we all need. And you get that sense of belonging and care by being a part of these groups. But I hear from people sometimes, you know, I, I tried that group thing, you know, we just didn't really connect very well, and, you know, it kind of fell apart, and, and we just tried it, but it just, just didn't really work for us. I mean, you don't just try it once. I mean, if you had an 18-year-old daughter or son, you sent them off to college, and they're looking for a church, and they went to that church three times, and they call you back and say, you know, tried it three times, and you say, like, okay, move on. Like, you know, don't bother with it. Just no big deal. No. You say, go find another church. And it's the same way with community. Community, this is the one and others. I mean, this is what church is about, connecting in relationship. And sometimes it is a process, and sometimes you do have to go find another group. But don't give up on community. I mean, my wife Tammy and I, we've, we've been doing these community groups most of our married life. Like, we just hit 37 years. And let me tell you, I mean, I could tell you some amazing stories of transformation. And just incredible experience in some of these community groups. And there's been other groups that are like, wow, this is a struggle. Like, this is hard. I mean, it kind of makes you like, do we want to keep doing this? 
But you can't give up on community. You got to keep after it. It's part of being the church. And I know for some of you, you know, it might be getting a little bit dry for you. I mean, I'm, I'm a professional Christian, you know. I mean, I know the Bible pretty well. And I, I, I tell you, I rarely sit in a communion group and think, wow, I've never heard that before. I mean, it's not about that. And maybe if that's where you are, if, it, if things are a little vanilla for you, it doesn't mean it's time to leave. It might mean it's time for you to lead. Do you need to be leading something? Creating an environment where there can be relationship, connection, discipleship, biblical community. And it doesn't just have to be in our adult community groups. I mean, we're trying to do this throughout the church. We're trying to do it with our students, doing it with our kids. I mean, we have such a vision for our kids' ministry, for every kid to come in and have a group of friends that they've built relationship with over time. And these families are connecting. And this leader is loving on these kids and these families. But, you know, we can't get there with that vision. I, and I saw that firsthand with my own granddaughter. She just moved into our fifth and sixth grade ministry in 56. And it was right at the end of her, of her time in our kids' ministry before she moved up that she made a friend. And let me tell you, it, it was a struggle to get her to church every week. But when she made that friend, it was crazy how it changed. And now she has a small group. And now she has a leader that's loving on her. It's amazing the change when we create that environment of biblical community. So I want to encourage some of you. Sorry, I don't know why that got there. <laughs> but maybe you need to explore leading a community group. Or it's a student group or maybe even a kid group here. We've got to reach this next generation. And that's how we do it. And so fill out that card. Check out that QR code there. And, and by the way, if you want to get into a community group on our website, uh, in fact, we'll put up a couple of slides here. This here on our community group says notify me when registration opens, which will happen in August. Go ahead and sign up. You can get on the list there. So that you'll be notified whenever that registration uh, site uh, opens up there. Well, finally, our team here at Heights, they really need you to come alongside them to volunteer somewhere, especially on the weekends. Remember, the church isn't meant to have professionals who are doing the ministry. Because we all need a place to connect in the body of Christ. And I know you're busy. But just remember, I mean, this entire church for the last 40 plus years have been, has been built by busy people. I mean, you ask any of our ministry partners. You say, okay, are you doing this because you have nothing else to do? No, no, like these are professional, get it done, busy people who say, this is a priority. I carve it out of my schedule, and I'm here because I'm on mission. But I know you're busy, and I get that. But just remember, it's God's will that you're engaged in the, in the local church, in the body of Christ. I don't know how else to say it. Let me just say that I, I feel so blessed in being part of this body. I just love our staff. We were uh, reflecting this last week at staff meeting. Just how great our team is here. We have, we have a great thing going. And I love our ministry partners. I mean, I'm just, I'm just blown away as I rub shoulders with a lot of you. Just your heart and passion to serve the Lord. Uh, it's, just, it's just amazing. And you know, people who come here, in fact, this just happened to summer camp just a week ago. They, they say to me, do you realize how awesome your, your ministry partners here are? I'm like, I know. It's amazing. And people are blown away by that. And let me just say, if you join one of these teams, you're going to really be blessed by that, because they, they understand this value that we have up on the wall out there. Have I mentioned we have values on the wall in the atrium? Yeah, it's called contributing, and they, and they value that. I'm just having a little fun with you there. Well, I'm telling you, my, my heart is so broken over the disunity in the church in America, and my heart is so broken over our, our loss as the church in our country, and, and we as a church, we've been 
reduced to a voting block. We're just a constituency. Constituency that both parties are just trying to wine and dine us, to split us up, to vote for their candidate of choice. And we're called to be the conscience of our nation. And there will always be disagreement, but there doesn't have to be disunity. You know, disunity is always a choice. Unity is a choice. But by being a vibrant, thriving, loving local church, we can be a part of fixing this. My heart also breaks over the, just the loss that we have of the next generation. I preached about this a few weeks ago, about how this next generation is just deconstructing their faith. And they don't need to. Especially when we step up as a church and do it, what we need to do in being the church. And I can tell you, I am just more passionate than ever. I'm more energized than ever because we have such great potential here at Woodman Heights. I mean, I don't know if you realize the reputation that we have in this community with some of these partnering organizations, with our school system, with the city. I mean, through the pandemic, we gained all kinds of credibility because of the way that you loved on our community, on our city. I mean, our, our food pantry just blew up. It was crazy. I mean, you know, our, our local partner schools, you know who the first one, one they call whenever there's a need? They call us. I mean, what happened to the separation of church and state? Right? It's amazing. And we need to leverage our potential. We need to make the most of every opportunity that we have as a church because all of us together are so much better than any one of us. And when we come together as a church, we can make an impact on this community. So I'm more energized than ever. But you know, in some ways, it really doesn't matter how energized I am, because what matters more is how energized you are. Because it's all of us together. And for those of you who have served over this past year and a half since we've been in person or have just given faithfully and consistent, consistently and helped us weather the storm or the pandemic, I mean... I just can't tell you enough just how grateful I am. Just amazing, your faithfulness and your hearts to serve. It, it really is astounding. To those of you who have grown a little bit content to just consume content, it's time to re-engage, to find your place in the body of Christ. And we want to help you find your place here in this body. So let's do this. We can do this. You know, against all odds, according to secular historians, this isn't just preacher talk. According to secular historians, historians, they talk about how the church radically changed the world once. It did. And there's so much in our world and in our community that needs to change. And by God's grace and with your help, I think we can affect change starting right here, right now in this community through Woodman Heights. And we have no idea how after we just go after it here, how we can ultimately impact this world. Historically, the Jesus movement should have been buried right along with its founder. But it wasn't. And John, the gospel writer, he said it this way. He said, the darkness did not, did not overcome it. So let's make sure the darkness doesn't overcome it in our generation, in our community, in our nation, on our watch. Because the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is worth it. And you won't regret it. And the faith of the next generation depends on it. So I want to give you an invitation to engage with this body. And you can drop off that card on the way out. You can take it to the tables to drill in a little deeper with some of our ministry partners and staff in terms of the various ministries that are out there. And, and by the way, if, if you're interested in learning more about spiritual gifts, uh, we're thinking about a, a class this fall. We'll let you know to just put gifts either on the comments section online or, or on your card there. But some questions that we all need to ask. As we close out, have you been influenced by our American rugged individualism? 
do it alone? Are you ready to take a step to engage in the, the body of Christ, which is a living organism that you're a part of, whether you want to or not, to join this amazing community here at Woodman Heights? Are you just an admirer of Jesus and looking for more content to consume? Or are you truly a follower of Jesus, engaged in the mission of Jesus to change our world? What's it going to be? Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you for this time in your word that we can share together today. And we just thank you for ministering to us. And we, we just ask that your spirit, Lord, just whatever words I've shared, Lord, they be your words, that your spirit would just take whatever each person needs to hear and to just open up their heart to, to whatever that is. So, Lord, guide us today. We just pray that uh, this would just really spring up faithful, fruitful ministry that we would just see you work in our hearts and, and in our community. Lord, we just want to be careful to give you all the praise and the glory for what you're doing here. We thank you we can be a part of it. But Lord, may you make us as a church to be a light in this community. And so Lord, I pray that you be with each one. Lord, as they're on this journey with you, just figuring out what that looks like. Lord, that uh, just open them up to just hear your voice. So we thank you for this time together, we pray in your name. Amen.